has officially made it to double digits so why not celebrate the only way we know how listen to a shoegaze album and try to describe the zhuzhing of guitars that's right jamie's gone and picked my bloody valentine's love list from 1991 you can find a link to the album in the description of this very podcast or just search for it on youtube we discuss the album its story of production pubescent emo phases and music more generally in this pod which i thought was a good one be sure to listen out for Jamie and Liv singing some Stone Roses later in the pod too. Leading us into the podcast this week is not the usual music, but the opener from Loveless, Only Shallow. Enjoy, and uh, wear ear protection. I'm being forced wow. to. <laughs> um, we really, we really missed you that week. You were here. <laughs> it's not even Valentine's Day. <laughs> <clears throat> what are we discussing then? All right. Jamie, this is your Jamie, job. Mate, um, this is it's is this your take. <laughs> have looking, you been on this podcast before, mate? We're begging you. I have no, so There's a lot of vinegar on the pod today. A lot of vinegar. <laughs> I thought Lily was using just a little intro. All right. That's like, I can do it. I don't mind. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you do mind. Yeah. You mind a bit, though, don't I you? I don't mind at all. I, oh, I couldn't mind anymore. Hello, welcome to Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> what did we do last week? We did Brazil. Yes. Uh, yeah. Brazil. Jamie didn't tell me, and Jamie didn't tell us what it was before I edited the podcast, so I didn't actually stick yeah, in no, what the all... next week's one was going to be. But in the, in the off mystery. season. You know, the thousands of fans have been heard. Mm. Uh, they want to know, what are we looking at this week? What are we looking at this week? Well, I can reveal to you, Louis, that this week we are talking about uh, the My Bloody Valentine album, Loveless. It came out in 91 on Creation Records. And it's part of the shoegaze genre. Ooh. Which comes from... Um, I think there's, there's like such two a good name. origins. It is a good name. It's quite a descriptive name. I think there's there's a couple of origins for it as well. So some people attribute that to the fact that because the genre is defined quite heavily by the amount of effects that are on the guitars, they would often the bands when they were playing live would have loads of like loop pedals on the ground. So they'd often be looking down, messing around with whatever they were doing to put different effects on. Um, and the other slightly less. Um, nice one is about just generally the members of these groups being kind of dejected teenagers who would look down at their shoes because they were disinterested in what they were doing. Or, which isn't as flattering, but... Probably a bit more accurate. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I don't no, know. I've heard that, you could I mean, to the more. shoegaze, calling it like shoegaze makes a lot of sense considering the fact that they're always like looking at the effects pedal board and stuff, so... And the, mm. I mean, they must have had like a million pedals for this album. Yeah, definitely. This this one has chopped full of effects. Mm. Um, it famously took a very very long time to record, over several months, and it cost the record label. I think it's either the equivalent of, or at the time, it was half a million pounds. <sighs> That's a lot. Of I think money. it's half a million dollars. I think it's technically Is it half a million dollars. dollars? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like two hundred fifty k. In, yeah, in some some have sterling. suggested nearly nearly brought that record label to to bankruptcy, mm. <clears throat> and as a result, I think they um they they eventually did go under, but um it became famous for that. There, there's one part actually which I learned about from one of the um the Pitchfork Line Notes videos that I sent you guys earlier, where they said on the song "To Hear Knows When." There's a um, tambourine on that. And you can barely even hear it as well. It's so low in the mix. But that part alone took them a week to record. 
They just spent one week on a tambourine. I was reading up on the album in like preparation for this conversation. I was just, it's Kevin Shields, the guitarist and sort of brains behind it, said that basically two years were spent making the album, but really it was only about four months worth of work. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't. I can't imagine having to say to the record label constantly, "Can you just give us a bit more money?" Yeah. So let's go to the new studio. It's like half a million, an insane amount to produce an album as well. Like, yeah, it is. Why would you need it's that like... much money to just like record in a studio? I don't see how studio it time, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I guess that's it. It took so long. I would. I would studio think... time, uh, equipment, personnel. Uh, and in this case, I mean, they all dispute the numbers because everyone points the finger at everyone for why it costs so much and about how much it actually costs. Everyone disputes how much it costs. But um, it's just that Kevin Shields was such a perfectionist and we're just like, he just wouldn't let engineers do their jobs. Uh. And we'd just like fire people, get new people in all the time. It's... And people would like cite mental health reasons why they didn't want to work on it anymore. He sounds <laughs> like sounds a nightmare. Like kind of an asshole. Mm. Mm. I actually don't think I could work with someone like that ever. I'd lose my mind. <laughs> I mean, I, quite I'm, yeah. I'm a thorough believer in you should be a fascist with art, but I mean that is that's it to an extreme, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> mm. And I, th- I think in this case it actually does work in his favour because what came out at the end of that is kind of become the um, I don't know, like the Magnum Opus or the, or the touch point for shoegaze, it's a lot, a lot of bands look back on this now and people say it's often replicated and that people have definitely tried to go back and recreate this sound. Um, so yeah, I, I can't quite remember like the first time that I listened to this album. I probably saw it on some kind of top 10 list somewhere or when I was reading up on the genre as a whole. Um, and then having gone to listen to it, I can say actually, on my first impression, I don't think I quite got it. It's one of those albums that I think maybe, with certain people, does have to sit for a while. And it wasn't until a couple of months after and quite a few listens after that it kind of really clicked with me or worked with me on that that degree, which is why I was quite interested to discuss it today because we've got a few people, I know myself and um, Louis are quite familiar with the album, but uh, Jack and Liv, I knew... Was this your first listen, both times? Oh, yeah. Which is quite interesting because I think it's quite a overwhelming first lesson I, I, I've heard the first song about a million times because I've gone to listen to this record about a million times and not really been lo- kind of lost interest after the first <laughs> song not like for any particular reason just I don't know yeah um, but I I didn't love the album particularly I thought it was like it was okay like mm-hmm. um just it, I don't know it kind of I I wanted a bit more of a like punch from it, I think. Because um, like that opener is great. Yeah, the opener is and sick. If more, yeah, more of the album was yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, I think I would have preferred it's it. It's the perfect start. Yeah, it really kicks off and like those that, really mm. high. I think it's that great, like that drum fill at the yeah. start. Yeah, just brings you right yeah, in. Yeah, it's got like um, pretty heavy grunge vibes from it, um, which is a genre that I have a lot of affection for um like smashing smashing mm. pumpkins and alice in chains and Soundgarden, people like that i'm a big fan of um so i got that i got like the vibe from that with all the like effects and stuff but yeah i don't know just i, I kind of just found myself like forgetting that i was listening to it and then like remembering that i was listening to it and i was like halfway through the album and there wasn't really like there weren't those like rises and falls and like pitches and stuff in the album. It was really it was kind of just one one long track to me. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And not not a particularly interesting one. Like it's good. I'll probably I'd, I'd probably stick it on in the background uh, and like write write to it. Um, because I like music that. Uh, it doesn't really have a lot of vocals and is quite ambient, which this sort of is in parts. But yeah, I don't know. It was alright. I'd I'd be really intrigued to hear what you say if you listen to it again a couple more times, maybe in a week or so. Maybe because I had more or less the same reaction the first time I heard this. Um, 
that I didn't get it. I knew it was an important album. My brother had told me a lot about it and that I should like it. So I put it on and I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> it kind of passed me by because like, you know, it, that first track feels the most like a proper pop song. Maybe the last song actually as well, but um, it didn't really stick with me. But then, uh, I don't know. It's one of those ones a few times later and the more I played it loud, the more I really, really got into it. I think you have to listen to it really loudly mm. to, to, to get its most visceral <laughs> intention. Well, uh, oh, okay, please. I'm just saying, like, I could tell when listening to it, there were so many layers to it, which was interesting. Um, and it's kind of like when we discussed the Eno album, like, loads of stuff. There are loads of different parts of play that you don't really realize, like, lots of, like, overlaying tracks and stuff um and loads of weird effects that make this right really quite sonically engaging sound i do like the sound of the album as well like i think it's it's a very it's a pleasurable listen but um it doesn't particularly like yeah it just didn't really yeah just i don't know you know when something works for you and when something doesn't particularly work yeah for you and, just doesn't mm-hmm. click yeah it just didn't click mm-hmm. but maybe it will click at some point um, I did feel I, f- I felt a, a similar attitude towards uh, Slint's album Spiderland when I first listened to that, but then I listened to that a few more times, and that's like one of my favorite albums uh, now. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I don't really have much more to say about it. I'll probably take a bit of a backseat <laughs> in this in this episode because I don't have like I don't have massively strong opinions one way or the other. I'm more sort of interested in what you guys mm. think. Mm. Uh, w- one other thing I'd like to say about the album is that uh, I think it is one of those g- albums that is seemingly simple in its nature, and I, I think I think quite often oh, that sounds wanky. I think quite often the greatest, my my favorite pieces of art, really reveal themselves really slowly to me. I'll be quite indifferent about it, but there's like a weird hook, and this is one of those albums to me that had a strange hook in me, that just kept me coming back, and I I just enjoy it more and more each time, and uh, it's no surprise to hear that this is one of my favourite albums. That probably wasn't a very difficult prediction, but I just love this album <laughs> so much. Mm. It's yeah, it's so. It's I'd so like good. to hear more. Live. I want to hear from yeah, you. Yeah, I will. Uh, deliver my thoughts but I'd like to hear more from you in a podcast about like why you love it so much because (laughs) for me this is how little context I had on my bloody valentine I thought they were like Mm -hmm. akin to my chemical romance and I don't know if you're getting them confused with bullet for my valentine yeah oh my god those three band names I think it's because they they're they're all like bullet for my valentine okay that's four but they're all like they're all romantic. Yeah, they're all romantic. Based. They've all got either Valentine or yeah, romance in. Or and, my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a Maya he. And, <laughs> or a word starting so with like, D. When I... <laughs> <laughs> so and like my bloody Valentine as a name sounds so emo. Like they they it sound does, right yeah, up yeah. my Chemical Romance Street. So when yeah. I googled my bloody mm-hmm. Valentine and saw that they were more like. 90s grunge sonic youth vibes i was literally like how has this been a massive gap in my music knowledge like i'm not completely <laughs> unversed in music and sort of genres and stuff i'm not like an expert yeah. but do you know what i mean like yeah. i can't believe i didn't know that isn't new isn't mm-hmm. neutral milk hotel like they're, they're a really big band in your the, in your estimations aren't they yeah i love so, them like, and they're and they're quite um I mean, they're they're very big on the internet, but like outside of sort of meme culture, they're not like very widely known. No, they're quite yeah, like a. So like yeah, you and I'm kind of the same as well because it's that era that I really like, mm. and it's the sound that I really like. So I should have I should have come across it far sooner than I did. Like probably when I was in my actual grunge phase, when I was a moody teenager. Mm. Um. Yeah. No, I feel I feel like if I listened to this album when I was seventeen and I sort of discovered it by myself, like late at night in my bedroom, and like listened to I it through my headphones, yeah. I was I feel like I'd feel like I'd discovered something really amazing. Mm-hmm. But obviously, yeah. the, 
because I'm sort I feel like now sadly as I've gotten older I'm hoping it's maybe just a phase but I feel like music doesn't really affect me in the same way as it did when I was a teenager and I don't know if it's just because I was sort of listening to all this new music for the first time back then and it was all like completely new or if it's yeah. because maybe I just have sort of found the music I like and I've I don't really know but I feel like I, I know what you mean yeah, I feel like I music doesn't really uh, hit me the same way as it used to, sadly. Well, unless I'm unless I'm writing, which is like the only activity that I can't do whilst listening to someone talk. I I exclusively listen to podcasts and YouTube videos now, pretty much. I barely ever listen to music now, mm. and I like on the one hand, it's like I kind of it's kind of sad, but on the other hand, it's like I don't know, like it it doesn't affect me the same way either that it used to affect me. When I, was, yeah. when I was a teenager and yeah I, I think it might I don't know I, I feel like I'm full I'm full up on music I know it is it is sad because I'm just <laughs> like thought, I used you. to be moved so strongly by music and like you know be like impacted by it loads emotionally and now like I can listen to a song and I can find it really moving and amazing but it just won't be the same yeah I um uh I remember being obsessed with bands and music and like just trying to learn everything about about them and mm. learn all the and now it's like i don't care like, I, at all i feel I like care. as a group we're more like discuss films more than music i was gonna say do, do you have you found uh, a similarity in that sense then between your relationship with like films and tv or do you not enjoy those in the same way as you used to um... or I feel like it's exclusive to music. This feeling. I feel like with music, like I was into it a lot earlier than I was into films, and now, mm. like I'm sort of, I don't know. I feel like I'm not that good at concentrating with films. So I think as I get older, I'm sort of getting better at concentrating and therefore enjoying them more. So it's kind of the opposite. But um, <laughs> anyway, back to the album. Um, <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. I think I'm definitely going to listen to it some more times. Um, I probably didn't enjoy it as much as the Brian Eno album. Um, it's definitely less less immediate. Yeah, in that sense, isn't the opening it? track is amazing, and I think works really well. And it's sort of that perfect level of like the perfect mix of like grungy and like yeah, like a more accessible pop rock track. Um, yeah, I think. The thing is with me is I like a melody, like I like quite a strong melody in one way or another. And while mm. this obviously like some of the songs do have melody in, it's obviously like not the focus of any of the songs or the album whatsoever. And like Yeah, they're like drowned in distortion. Yeah, exactly. You can barely even hear what the lyrics are, which isn't necessarily a problem because like I love Alt J and you can barely ever hear the Alt J what lyrics Alt J <laughs> singing or the strokes for that matter. You can barely ever hear what they're saying. But they've yeah. got a strong melody, so you can sort of like sing along incorrect words and still get the same effect. <laughs> That's actually quite similar to what the singers did for this album. Is that um, what was it Belinda Butcher, I think, or Melinda Butcher, uh, the the female singer who did about a third of the lyrics? Is that Kevin Shields would go in and record a lot of the lyric, I uh, think, the songs. But he was so unfussed about being able to hear a clear voice. He hates that. He wanted it to be more like a sound, mm. like another instrument. Mm. And so when she had to go in and re-record the parts for herself, she had no idea what the lyrics <laughs> are, so she'd just have to guess what the lyrics were. Like, they just make notes. And like, after, at the end of like 10 hour long studio session, you just make them all up on the... <laughs> which I think is really funny. funny. Which, which, which speaks think... to what you said there. Yeah. I think that's apt as well, like with the Brian Eno comparison, because it's interesting that those are the two albums that we've talked about so far in this podcast, and both of them are kind of concerned more with texture yeah. and mood than they are with yeah. like storytelling yeah. or lyrics <clears throat> or any of those kind of more like musical things. Like, like you were saying, Jack, it has got some ambient things, and I, I think maybe what has attributed to the thing that you said about it all sounding like one long lesson is the fact that they compress so many of the sounds here. There is so much going on, but they kind of drown it all in that same effect and push it all together. So it's such like a... It, it does feel like one movement rather than individual instruments yeah, being played. Yeah, it's, it's like... Um, 
it's like a like a composition, and each song isn't really a separate song. It's just a, another movement in the in the composition, mm. which is cool, and I like that. One of my favorite albums actually is uh is Jerusalem by Sleep, and that's that's an hour ten of just like yeah, much, just one riff. one riff, and it's just it's just awesome. Yeah. But most of the bands are doing similar things that that are said to be imitators. They're actually doing quite different things from us, but with with, with the same kind of overall thing um mood but uh i think a lot of the bands couldn't imitate us if they wanted to really tell the truth because they don't really think they know what we really do they get they get a, a rough you know it's like with any band really. it's like we took a band, like, or a band like the ramones when the ramones imitators never sounded like the ramones to me ever Actually, another like one of the interesting musical things that they did with the chords on this, and I saw this on a, um, I think it was a BBC documentary. It was something like the Joy of the Guitar Riff or something like that. We'll link to it in the description. But one of the things Kevin Shields would do would be that he would play a chord, and then with the um, whammy bar, he would detune whatever he was playing. So he'd play something, detune it, and then by the end, that's like why there's so many of. Almost like you know those slide sounds in the yeah. guitars where it sounds like it's going way less down pedals on up. this than you think there is. Way mm. less. It's it's so much of it is actually his guitar technique. Oh, cool. Which is what which is what so many people like since have tried to copy from this. Mm. So try to do with like I, I remember reading an interview with him and it's like that's that's how I did it. I would go I would send it through all these EQs on my amp and like bounce them and send them back to other ones and just sort of do it in a really, really long-winded way. And a person said, like, can you not just achieve that by pedals? And it's like, yeah, but not... Oh, I can't remember. He had a really good turn of phrase that was, uh, you can, but uh, not through process or something. I don't know, it's like... I've already butchered that. Um, <laughs> insert, insert the soundbite insert, here. Though. It's all right. I'm editing this. I'll cut, out. I'll, I'll cut out every time I sound stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just that that's his way of doing it. And I don't think that he could have achieved it any other way. Mm. I, I, I think he thoroughly be- believes in the obsessive nature is what creates this thing. Yeah, that's cool. I respect that. Um, to go back to the lyrics as well, uh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, <clears throat> I I like the fact that there aren't really lyrics. Like I didn't really think about the the singer, like the vocals. I didn't think of them as, oh, it's time to listen to what the singer's saying. Do you know what I mean? And like it just it, it kind of gets uh, integrated with the whole sweeping aura of the album. It doesn't like stand out as a separate thing in itself, which I think most uh, which tends to happen with most music with vocals um i think i i think that like uh if you're good if, unless you're like tom waits or someone who's got a really good like lyrical style or like you can tell a story or paint a picture with lyrics then maybe just don't bother <laughs> just 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 focus on the music mm. like do you know what i mean unless you've got like a really beautiful voice like tom york um do you know what I mean? All the Toms. Yeah, I just don't think it's like Tom Jones even. Yeah, Tom Jones. <laughs> you know. I, yeah, I don't. I don't think that like vocals in in a piece of music are of particular importance, and lyrics aren't really either to me. So certainly not on this album. Now, I yeah, I think they share that. The lyrics are pretty yeah. nothingy, aren't they? Yeah, it's whatever. I, I, I didn't even look them up. Like, them. like Jack yeah, said, I, 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 I could didn't. Never it never crossed them. my mind yeah. to even look. I did look because it, it just felt unimportant. Well, there's no point. Like, it's not going to add anything to my experience of the album at all. Like, it's how it sounds, and it sounded nice. Like, it sounded like a siren, a siren singing. I just think I was looking for something distinctive. Like, I don't, I don't actually think that's the fault of the album because I don't think any of the songs mm-hmm. are meant to sound like isolated necessarily, but. I was sort of like trying to look up some of the lyrics to just be able to like distinguish each of the songs, but they're all pretty similar. And one thing I noticed is that um, I guess it's like part of the dreamlike ethereal nature is that the the lead vocalist in pretty much every track literally takes so long to move through whatever lyrics there are. Like it'll be like 
two minutes into the song and I'll literally be like one verse down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I I think that's what really threw me off the first time I ever listened to it. I was about 13. I was just like, there's, there's no fucking tunes, man. There's no tunes. Mm. Uh, and the uh, the main ones I did remember were the first track, uh, the fourth track, which is called To Hear Knows When, yeah. which is the one that sounds like the, the Jurassic Park theme. The da, 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 da. <laughs> I never thought about that. It uh, does. <laughs> and the one afterwards. Um, when you sleep. Um, when you sleep, yeah. yeah that, those are the tracks I always remember really, really liking mm. of it, and then the rest I could sort of leave. But um, this week, as I've listened to it a lot while while writing, similar to Jack, um, the the more droney ones I've actually really gotten into more, I, I guess, because if, if 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 you try to detach yourself kind of away from the listening experience and you sort of dip in and out of it, the points I was find myself paying attention to most were actually the drone parts this time, mm. which is uh, odd. I'd never, I'd never appreciate those parts as much before. Yeah, yeah. weirdly, weirdly, one of my favourite songs was the like <coughs> the, the interlude track. I think it's called "Touched." I, oh yeah, in between Luma and yeah, I really well. liked that one. It was only, mm. I think it's only about a minute long, but I just think it's got. It does a lot in that time, and it sounds really nice. That's a problem with music. Like sometimes it's hard to know what to say other than it sounded really nice. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's, like, it's so subjective, it's, isn't it? Like we, when you watch the needle drop, and it has an insane amount of knowledge on like production and music, music theory. Music theory, yeah, everything. Right, it's a sound mm-hmm. he knows, and he's more or less an expert in like the field of music. Um. You listen to him break it down, and then you, he's like saying things that you'd never even think to like, like think about when you're listening to a piece of music, like at all. Um, it, it's and it, one of the reasons why music is great is because it's such a like it's such a it awakens a really primal part of your brain, which is mm. it doesn't require any intellectualism to like appreciate music really. Yeah. What it requires is just like a pair of ears and the willingness to listen. And like you can only really, the only thing you can really have is an emotional reaction from it. You know what I mean? <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's I... literally how, how music makes you feel. I completely just... agree. And I think unless you have like a really deep technical knowledge of music or like music production which I think some people do and they can really talk technically about music um I think I've noticed like when I read like album reviews they just are really good at wording like how it makes them feel or certain yeah. effects in just a really cool way or just like a way you wouldn't ever think of and it's just like they're not actually doing anything clever they're just good writers who enjoy music mm-hmm. and are able to write about music uh, I don't think they're yeah. particularly like well, I don't know, maybe I'm sort of downplaying music critics, but I think a lot of the time it's just <laughs> they're good at wording things. It's it's definitely a really difficult art, isn't it? It's to so describe difficult. something that can only be heard. It's, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like, Jack, like you were saying, I guess in a way it's completely accessible to everyone, but in a way, I don't know, maybe it's kind of like only accessible like at one stage and then beyond that it's sort of... Like music appreciation like yeah. requires it requires some form of like uh some further reading and what have you mm. maybe yeah well you you can like review a, a tv show or a film or even a book after one reading or viewing whereas if you were to a professional critic was to review an album after only listening yeah. to it once that would oh, be gotcha. frowned upon oh yeah it's kind of a thing yeah, that you really, kind of need it's to kind sit of a strange medium in that way isn't yeah it? you it's it's expected that you kind of need to sit with it for a bit, and I think like bringing it back to this album, that's it's something that it kind of expects you to do in a way. It it doesn't jump out at you immediately. It doesn't try to, like you said, pull any big singles or um, have these really melodic moments. It just it shoots uh, for a very very specific 
kind of style and mood. Yeah. And then, depending on where you're at, I suppose it like adjusts to that. Because, like you said, Liv, there's lots of people, particularly in the comments for these videos, who talk about discovering it as a teenager or this being like reminiscent of a hazy summer that they had once. So I think, yeah, a lot of it is down to age and context mm. as well. But to even to be able to capture that in like a sonic way is such a cool feat, mm. I think. And it's something that this does really well. Yeah. In that it kind of, it almost, and this, this could sound a bit like pretentious as well, but it, it kind of sounds like memories in the way that they're never quite as clear or defined. Mm. It, do, it does sound mm -hmm. nostalgic. For yeah, sure. that's probably a better For way sure. of describing it that's not as... Asshole. It kind of, <laughs> it kind of has the same like spirit as Joy Division music, like Joy Division's album, um, Unknown mm -hmm. Pleasures. Mm -hmm. Like, although yeah. they're they're sure. quite different, but I think I when I was listening to it, I was getting strong Joy Division vibes. In the same way, it's like it sort of speaks to that teenage. Uh, it's pretty post punk. Yeah, isn't it? it's, yeah, you can see the influences. You, you you can see the building blocks from that scene that have gone into this. Yeah. Disaffected youth, essentially. Yeah, like the same spirit as carries yeah. through the album as with Joy Division songs, which is what yeah. I liked about it a lot, actually. One of my favourite aspects of the album is actually the artwork. Mm, it's I sick. Yeah. Yeah, we it's we amazing, referenced this it? in back in the Eno episode. We, oh, really? <laughs> I, I think I said... Oh, yeah, that, we did. That's I think crazy. I said uh, that the album artwork for Eno is so good and it, it kind of sounds... Sorry, it looks like how it sounds. Yeah. And I said the best example of that is Loveless by Lovely yeah. Fan Sign. Lo and behold, what, eight weeks later? That's crazy. Wow. We really have come full <laughs> circle. Yeah. All right, we should end the podcast now. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> <laughs> no, this but, is the last but, episode. Guys. But going back Thanks to that whole listening. nostalgic thing, um, I when I listened to this this week, it really, really gave me the urge to play music again in a way that I don't get when I listen to a lot of music. It's just the, sure, sorry, the, the sheer visceral sound of this made me really, really want to get behind a drum kit again and just make really really loud sounds and i just think it kind of mm. captures that sheer joy mm. for music in a weird way yeah. like you, you can hear the obs the obsession in it mm. and i think it's quite infectious within the, within the record he, kevin shield says that he's quite heavily inspired by uh the beach boys mm. and i think the the beach boys uh best quality you know their magnum opus pet sounds their best quality on that is it has such a joy for music mm. and uh totally. I, I feel like this this really taps into that feeling really nicely but in a completely different sonically mm. way yeah and when we, we were talking at the start about how like he was super specific about how this was to be made and kind of you know he's been described as a perfectionist quite a lot as a result of this and i think if you think of like all the the big artists or the people who are really dedicated to their craft it's kind of those people that will are just so blindly determined on this one vision that they want to create that they'll kind of disregard or they they, they don't mind pissing people off to get to it and it, it's funny that you say that again about the the drums louis because i think although they're not that prominent on this album when they do show up they're really good he and only played live amazing. on two tracks, apparently, on the record, the drummer. Oh, really? Was he was first in the last one? Uh, it, uh, definitely the first track. Because he had really bad health like, at the yeah. time. That, that's why he couldn't be there for so much of it, was that he was really ill. And so he oh, would okay. play what parts he could, and the rest was all sampled. So that's why some of the tracks have quite low energy drums, but you really, really feel it when they are there, like on the first track. They really, really drive the piece. I really love them on on the that last track soon. Yeah, like it it's comes so dancey, after, isn't it? Yeah, and it comes after quite a few of like the droney um, songs, like "Blown a Wish" and "What You Want," and then that one finally comes in. I think it's such a great way to, and it's similarly to the first track. It's like another, I think, one of their more accessible ones on the album. Yeah, I know it was. It came on a EP. Yeah, on um, the Glide EP, I think it's this. called. That, funnily enough, another strange <clears throat> link. Um, Brian Eno was a champion of that EP. Oh, really? Yeah, when it came <laughs> out, he was like super, super positive about it. And um, the shadow of Eno. I think he called it like the the future of pop music or something like that. Which <laughs> of course he would. 
probably didn't turn out to be entirely true. But what, what is the legacy of this album? Like, how was it received when it was released? Did it make a lot of money or? Critically, it did really well. People love. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the the music world loved it. it. I don't think it recouped much money. It charted at like twenty four or twenty five. Yeah, uh, and considering how much it cost to record, I think that. Uh, I, be, I think they got dropped from creation after it because they were kind of yeah. disappointed. I did read that. Um, uh, quick quick anecdote. My, I said to my brother while we were having our roast dinner earlier, oh, guess what we're chatting about tonight on the pod? We're chatting about Loveless. He's like, oh, brilliant. Tell, the, tell your mates about the time I met Alan McGee, the head of Creation Records. <laughs> uh, he came to one of their gigs once, oh, the nice. Black Tambourines gig, when they supported Jesus and Mary Jane. And so they all met. That's, That's it. it. Oh, sorry, no, sorry. No. They met Alan McGee. Sorry, they met Kevin Shields. Oh, sorry, I got that completely wrong. Okay. They met oh, Kevin yeah. Shields. Alan McGee quite a few times, but Kevin Shields that one time at my bloody Valentine. Game. No, at a bloody <laughs> Jesus and Mary Jane gig. Sorry, my bloody uh, Jesus. My, <laughs> my Kevin my Romance gosh. gig. <laughs> <laughs> my bullet for my Valentine. <laughs> bullet for the Mary Jane. Uh, have you seen the the <laughs> music video? Bullet for the Mary Jane. <laughs> Have you seen the uh, music video for Tears Don't Fall by Bullet For My Valentine? No. I haven't. It's no. really funny. <laughs> I don't think I've ever it's, listened to Bullet For My Valentine. It's really, Valentine. really stupid. Ways to kill the conversation. <laughs> Ask everyone, have you ever seen the video? To... A Bullet For My Valentine proper grommy. Cause that's... <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what they I don't know. I just know that they're part of that like emo yeah, scene. Yeah, like really quite cringy. Wait, my Chemical that, Romance I, I was comment. Black Parade, that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. What was what did Bullet for My Valentine I do? I think that's... Well, they did st- did... Well, that song, Jackson. I think it was Born Don't Fall is like the only one I know. Um, but that it's just like your Kerrang regulars, really. <laughs> I kind of vaguely remember their music videos on, on the Kerrang, like you say. But uh, I, would, I would flip over because it wasn't my kind of thing. No, no. no. I don't know. Yeah, um, Did you guys ever go through like that emo phase in your early teens? Oh yeah, massively. I didn't, and I feel like I, I missed either, out. Because you know, like, like when you're with people sometimes, and they're like, "Oh, mm, Paramore," and it's like, "Yeah, I liked the only exception yeah. when that got big and Glee did it, but that's about as far." As <laughs> 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 um, I, yeah, I, you know, your scene's dead when Glee do it. Honestly, Glee <laughs> introduced me to so much music. I was, I was. Properly... Maybe that's the problem. Maybe Glee never did a bloody Valentine episode. Yeah, that's that's why. Why. I, it was, it's not clicking. I, I went through that phase because I was properly into Nirvana and like that's like the soundtrack to puberty for like a lot of teenage boys. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and, um, I was into Nirvana. But I got like super into it and um, yeah, just like was really cringy and emo and thought everything was rubbish that wasn't like from the nineties <laughs> or like didn't have like screamo in it. Um, but yeah, I grew up. I grew up pretty quickly. Um, so let's go with that. I had that phase at like year six because my my brother <laughs> would have had that phase like at the age you're talking about. But because all of my cultural references were from Jake, uh, I just I had that same phase at the same time he did Shout because out of to him. Jake. And so I kind of, I kind of got through it. I Another exercised part. those emo demons quite quickly. <laughs> that was good. Before, that... before they got embarrassing. I honestly think yeah, I had the youngest me, emo phase that could probably be possible. My emo phase, I was about seven, I was about seven years old. Um, and I was massively into Evanescence, Whoa. Blink-182, who obviously, <laughs> in hindsight, aren't actually that emo. But, you know, no, I was really not. into... <laughs> yeah, I know, punk. but I was like... You know, they were emo and... Actually, it wasn't even emo back they then. They play guitars, man. So They've I, got attitude, like, haven't they? Like, if you they? cry every time at Bowling for Soup. So it was like... <laughs> Good Charlotte was like the height of music. and I was Oh, like, God. I only wore crop tops that said, like, misunderstood on it. And, like... <laughs> and you, got, you got a tattoo that was said it, damaged. Was it misunderstood spelt with two S's? Yes, exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> I was that shirt. Jack the same t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my, my emo yeah. phase, wearing seven-year-old clothes. <laughs> you were fourteen, but you looked like wearing seven-year-old Wait, so clothes. So why were you wearing a top that said "misunderstood"? I wasn't. Oh, okay. I was 
<laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is canon now. This, this is truth. <laughs> Uh, it happened, Jack. Come I'm on. just going to cut out you denying it. <laughs> God damn it. Basically, so like they obviously started like the whole shoegaze genre and obviously as I was saying like I really like a strong melody like a vocal melody in my in my mm. music generally and I was like before I actually listened to this album I've been just listening to that um, Stone Roses track Shoot You Down and mm. that's pretty good isn't I'd it? love to do mm. it and you know you'll always let it come and don't yeah um <laughs> it's quite that's become yeah. the jingle you were gonna go that yeah. far with you it, guys, to be honest you guys have no idea what's gonna happen with oh that my one. god dub our voices over a karaoke <laughs> version that would be good <laughs> Um, but yeah, but obviously that the Stone Roses I read online and I did actually observe it in my self conscious. They're quite a similar like the the dream like vocals which are quite quiet mm. and and the sort of mm-hmm. yeah the blurred guitar usage. Um, yeah. But I think what the thing is, I like, I listen to that album, but I'm still humming the Stone Roses, and it's just like I need mm. more of that in that. Yeah, I know what you mean. But um... I, could have done with it the to music. be a, a, it's a very a anthemic album that the one. music video for i want to be adored is um that has fairly good uh fairly similar vibes to this it's like lots of purple and um dream yeah dream like quality um mm. but yeah like i think yeah stone rose is definitely an apt comparison um yeah what year is that album came out 1989 that one so it? roses. Yeah. Bloody hell, yeah. that is earlier than I remember it. That's, mm. not that I was that's also know, quite yeah. a while after the Loveless album, though. Uh, before, a couple of years before. Before, 1991, so was, Loveless came Loveless was 91. Wait, so what year was the Stone Roses album? That's staying in. Oh, <laughs> I think it said 98, sorry. Or 99. <laughs> 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 nah, other way around. Other way around. <laughs> no, you've been sipping on dumb bitch juice. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, and out. And out. Yeah. I yeah, think. I mean, some of the other groups that kind of preceded them that kind of led towards the shoegaze thing, but I don't think properly like kickstarted it till My Bloody Valentine did. Have people like, funny enough, Jesus and Mary Chain. And the Cocteau Twins as well, kind of. Yeah, I've been getting into them the past couple of weeks, actually. They're pretty good. I've never heard of them. I mean, and it's it's kind of all characterised by that same thing. So it's all, the guitar kind of drowns out some of the vocal melodies and everything's got loads of distortion on it. Um, So I I can definitely see what you mean about it. Yeah, definitely initially there's not much to hang on to in terms of these songs. And that was exactly, like I said, my first experience with it as well. So I was kind of expecting that on, on... they're such a mysterious band as well. Uh, when they when they disbanded towards, I think it was nineteen ninety eight. Uh, the the material they had was supposedly really jungle influenced, which I would absolutely love to have heard. They lost it all, but I would love to have heard this album, but like pushed in that direction. <laughs> I've, I've already gotten into jungle music recently. Oh, it's great, and, isn't it? Uh, it's so good. It <laughs> it's so good for exercising it's, as well. It's a really and fun genre. It really, really is. Uh, I've, I've shouts out to that Ronnie Size album, New Forms, because that is honestly like 
the creme de la creme of jungle. Um, and yeah, I, I would, I, I, I think this music lends itself so well to, uh, to be, I guess it's kind of, I guess it's kind of down to its production style, but because it's so about its wall of sound production style that you can apply that to so many different other kinds of genres that would have been so much fun. Mm. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting. A lot of people talk about the influence of this album in kind of the indie guitar band sphere. But I think actually it, it's kind of... It's, um, effect reaches further than that. I mean, distortion is something that's hugely popular in pop music and hip-hop at the moment. And I don't know whether how much of that you can attribute to this kind of thing, but certainly like it's with the 90s being such a touchstone as well at the moment for quite a lot of artists who grew up in that decade, I, I don't think you can discount like some of the lasting influence that this has had on other, on other mm. genres. Yeah, I think it's really like successful in what it's set out to do. Like, oh. <laughs> it's alright. <laughs> every time, every episode. <laughs> Jack just fell over. <laughs> <laughs> my phone fell over sorry um continue yeah like um like you're saying jamie it's a proper wall of sound like i wasn't noticing it when like it sort of eases you into how all-encompassing it is really well um because it just sort of starts on that first track and then it so it doesn't stop yeah it doesn't stop like the duration of the entire album but then, like, I paused it, like, halfway through, and all the noise, like, drained from the room, like, so suddenly, and left it feeling so empty. So I think it creates that fullness so well, and I guess that's to do with all the, like, the layers and the distortion um, that's, like, gone into the production that's been able to achieve that effect really well, which I really liked about it. The whole album's in mono as well. So to really add to that wall of sound is that, that you can't hear yeah. any difference between left and right. I was going to say there aren't that many, like, I don't actually know whether dynamics is the right word. Is that the right word, Louis? Depends on what you're about to say next. <laughs> like in terms of, you know, you were saying about like the stereo, there's not much like, obviously there's no panning because it's all mono and it's all in the same one. And there's not that because it's all so com- compressed, but purposefully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you mean by mono? Yeah. Uh, mono is when you're hearing, uh, you're hearing the same output out of both. If you're wearing headphones oh, or speakers, okay. they're both playing the same thing. Where a stereo, in panning, you would like, let's say, you want the drums in the left channel, oh, and the guitar in the right. I much prefer mono. It's so annoying when it's just like all through. I do as well. Like, say you're just listening to one headphone. Or like one earphone, yeah. and it's like it depends what you're listening to. Yeah, it can be used to. If good it's effect. well mixed, you won't notice it. Mm. But but like those 2009 Beatles remasters they did are so notoriously bad for their panning. It's like I remember listening to the track when I'm 64 with one. I think only one of my earphones worked once, and the whole song oh, was yeah. just bassoon. Yeah. There's no vocals. It's <laughs> 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 I was like, I swear that I swear that used to be lyrics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I so said this wasn't a bassoon <laughs> solo. <laughs> well, that was the 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 thing with those two masters because the originals were they only had a four track machine, and then if you wanted any more than four tracks, you had to compress them into one, bounce them to yeah. a different machine, add those compressed, and bounce them back loads of four. So like loads of the tracks in those ones were compressed in not a good way or not intentionally. Um, and I think for the the white album remasters, they found the original tapes, so they were able to separate them all back into their original channels into how they were originally meant to be heard. Yeah, like that, if you listen to the original version of the White Album and then that one that came out two years ago for the 50th yeah, anniversary, the, 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 the mixing is one. night and day. It, the, the remaster one sounds incredible. They just, it, they gave the song so much more punch. And what I like about this album is that I think it goes to show how much of music is in the studio. It, I mean, obviously... They're, All albums are in studio, the unsung but heroes, this album is so sound exactly. It's that exactly the that's what it's where the magic happens. I like <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I like an album that's got like a a little production history behind it, and like you can yeah yeah. This album's quite a pick to this one. Yeah, yeah, like 
it's nice when there's a story and meaning behind what you're listening. Not meaning, but just you know, it's it's been Something places. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, also to kind of expand on what you were saying, Louis. I think it's its uh, greatest achievement, and it's something I think that boils down to a lot. We were saying earlier about how music critics and talking about music is very difficult unless you know some of like the technical feelings um, and the technical language, sorry. But with this one, I think it prioritises that mood over anything else. It's just concerned with how it wants to yeah. make you feel, mm-hmm. which is probably like the most important part of music, ultimately. Um, regardless you... of how you do it, whether it's through lyrics or a certain guitar sound or something, this one just puts that at the forefront and keeps it there for the entire time. Which album. is amazing that it, it reaches that... Oh, sorry, it achieves its concern of how it makes you feel entirely from its production. Not even really its instruments, mm. just how they've made those instruments sound. Mm. I'm sure if you actually looked up how to play these songs, they're all pretty yeah. simple. Yeah. Uh, like, four to the floor... Uh, pretty simple chords. Actually, I I, I think he used some weird tunings for some of them, but still, I, I I can't imagine they're like structurally they're not very complex when I was listening to them. Yeah. But it's because you're so captivated by the wall of sound, you can't help but just sort of gaze at it. It's kind of like um when minimalists use uh, a very limited note pattern, um, but then they just keep overlaying, like with Steve Reich, electric counterpoint. Um, yeah. Plays like a series of guitars playing the sort of the same sort of melody but slightly lower down and uh with a bit more um maybe a bit more bass or a bit more treble on it and then it's playing in slightly different times like out of sync time signatures and stuff um and it creates this overwhelming sound like obviously that's uh, it's quite different to what we're talking about because it's minimalist but sort of the way the the approach to composition is quite similar i think Mm, i think that i think Nowadays, that's not that I know this might be a really ignorant comment, but I feel like that's maybe one of the most important or important ways to make music sound new or to create new sounds in a studio. Like, I don't want to say we've heard it all before, but we have kind of heard it all before. Yeah, Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's getting harder to find something that sounds original. Guitar music in particular, like the the, the old school sort of piece like rock band isn't really a thing anymore um mm. which is why i think you've seen such a prominence or because these people have always been there but you've seen producers come to the forefront a lot more recently because of mm. that and like you know they've almost become as important as in well they, they've mm. like i said they've always been really integral to how an, an album sounds but i think it's being widely accepted a lot more that I don't know whether people kind of back in the day would get excited hearing that a specific engineer was going to produce this album or produce a whatever album, but it certainly happens now. And I think that's because so much of what makes music engaging kind of in the last 10 years has been from the studio yeah. and the producer. Mm. I think that uh, the advent of the internet has allowed people to, it's allowed the curtain to be pulled back a bit and, allow people to see mm-hmm. more technical sides of things like even with f- film and tv and music like what goes into making all these things whereas before that all you got given was what you were, what you were given and then you have to really go some unless it was like news you'd have to go some to find out what the story behind it was or like who i mean you could see it in the credits but of like the, of the album sleep, you wouldn't necessarily care or know you were looking at. Whereas now you can just Google that yeah. person's name, see mm. what else they've worked on, uh, then like see how much input they had and all that stuff. It's like a interconnected web and stuff. So yeah, like interestingly, both of the producers on this album are both members of the band. Mm. So I think like they were have that also like chief concern in their mind as well, but. You know, it kind of drives home the, the point that we've been making about them having such a specific idea for how they wanted this to sound, and so much of what makes it great. I think they were aware that it was going to come from how how it was produced and it being produced right. In my like uh, music frame of reference, or like out of my personal interests of music, when I think about like the last ten fifteen years, 
the music that is the most innovative or that like is the most forward thinking or it's like you know potentially it has the potential to be the most influential like Kanye West music Alt J um, and Frank Ocean I think what makes it that way is the production level and I guess that's sort of similar to this album like it's so heavily focused on production and making it what it is well, I, I think that level of mysticism goes a long way as well. In terms of, uh, let's say, Frank Ocean's Blonde, the stories about that album, I think, tie into the overall package of what that album is, of like how, how long it took to come out between his first one and uh, all these sorts of goings-ons in, goings in his life. Mm. Uh, I think, like you say, having that story behind an album really does go quite a long way yeah. to helping canonise it. I remember hearing Richard Ayoade say on Adam Buxton's podcast that best picture winners uh, in the Oscars these days typically have a story behind the yeah. film of like how it got made and uh, a sort of like further reading thing. I think that the film that won it the year he said that was The Revenant and it's like, oh yeah, it was so hard to film. Leonardo DiCaprio actually ate a liver. There were all those weird rumours that he actually got fucked by a bear, <laughs> which I don't know. I still don't know where that rumour came from but I remember hearing that, that one. I believe that was a mistranslation <clears throat> from a foreign press. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, I guess I say so. But yeah, I, I think... I think having an air of mysticism about the film or of album in this case uh, does help canonize yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Mm. That's definitely true of this one as well. I mean, after this, I think from creatively from uh, Kevin Shields to the rest of the band, they went quiet for a very, very long time and only followed, followed this album up, I think, in 2013. Yeah. So it was a good 22 years of silence. Um, wow where this record was just left to sit with people before eventually they did. And I don't think they've done anything since. They just have those three studio albums yeah. at the moment. But yeah, I think a certain amount of that mystery is poured into this as well. Yeah, that, that, that's a similar thing that uh, Slint did, I think. They just recorded, they recorded Spiderland in like a week or something ridiculous. And then they toured it like once. And then they toured it on the anniversary of the album. And they've just not played together or done anything with that name since. Mm. And like ne- yeah. Neutral Milk Hotel is uh, basically that exact same. <laughs> How it happened with mm. them? It's, yeah, it's weird. These like these really, really like creative, like almost geniuses, um, have their like moment, their like lightning in a bottle moment, and then mm. they just can't seem to like live up to that standard. They just disappear. Again, yeah. You know it's what though. Tragic. I respect them so much more for just like putting it to bed and not like making people who love their music listen to shit for years and years after hoping to get that same feeling Mm -hmm. and then just being so disappointed and disillusioned with like all their music. There's actually nothing worse than a band who just drags you through like five albums of hell. I've always found it funny how even to this day when people talk about the Stone Roses, when they talk about the second coming... They're like, oh, shame about that second album, though, isn't it? <laughs> People still say it. Oh, that, oh yeah, I, first album yeah. was amazing. Shame about second. Yeah, there's a joke in Sean of the Dead. It's not even that bad. It's not even that bad. It's pretty good. It's, no, that's a joke in Sean of the Dead. It's fine. Purple Rain. Oh, Sign of the Time. Definitely not. The Batman soundtrack. Probably. Ah. Ah. Okay. Oh, die straight. Throw it. <laughs> Uh, no, same coming. I like it. That being said, though, they uh, we should probably, before we wrap up this pod, say that they they made this album like only once they were sure they'd nailed the live thing. They were a very like notorious live act. Uh, when they finally got round to making this album, releasing it, and they toured, uh, it became a really infamous tour because of the punishing decibel levels. Uh, that they would subject the fans to. Yeah, it, there are loads and loads of reviews of their gigs. It's like people streamed out because they couldn't take it after about four minutes. They had to stop doing the album, by the way, for two weeks because the uh, Shields and uh, Butler got tinnitus. 
so they just had to oh, stop God. for two weeks while they while they healed. Jesus. Uh, so yeah, they were also. I think they took that American tour they did promoting Loveless was uh, deemed the second loudest tour of all time. I don't know what the first was. <laughs> I should have looked into that. Slept off. <laughs> have to yeah insert that in post. Um, post I do discussion. wonder like how easy it would be to like reproduce this album live because. I was listening to it and I was like, I feel like so much mm. fun. Obviously, it wasn't because it was so laboured and clearly so much thought went into it and it was very technical. But I just think it seems like the sort of sounds you produced, you'd be like trying for ages to get it right. And then you finally you get like everything comes together and you produce the right sound. But then you forget how to like reproduce it. And then, like when you're performing it live, I imagine it must be really difficult. They mm. they got a flautist live to play with them to fill out the high end, yeah. which was apparently amazing. The people that saw it said the flautist was like the best part of the show. Like she was amazing. The woman who played. The flute I love the flute sounds in the album. Like that was a big highlight, and I think that elevated a lot of the songs. Which you know, if I was listening to it, and then I could hear. I don't. Was it actually a flute they used to record it? I don't know, actually. I, it never crossed my mind. I assumed it was a synth, but maybe it actually was a flute if they did tour with a flute. It, it had a flute-like effect, basically. And I think that that was like a... <laughs> yeah, it was flute-esque. It was, flute-esque. <laughs> it was, it was a very flute <laughs> <Flute-esque. laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we had to forego the ratings we normally give this week as Jack's microphone suddenly shat the bed. Luckily, it was only the end of our discussion anyhow, and if you couldn't tell, we really liked it, broadly speaking. Cheers to JME for the pick this week, and Jack's turn next, and he has picked a four-episode drama podcast series called The Harrowing, so find that where you find podcasts for next time. Till then, salivate. Salivate.